Chairman Hall, Representative O'Brien, Chairman Mike, you, sir, uh, Leader Caparo, and the three men, Jack Sarafat, and the uh, General Assembly. Welcome back. Uh, members of the uh, of this uh, special committee here, good morning. I am Tom Stewart. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Ohio Oil and Gas Association, which is a state-based trade association representing the common interests of over 1,900 members who are engaged in exploration and production of crude oil and natural gas within the state of Ohio. We've represented uh, uh, this industry since 1947. Today's hearing is focused on the Underground Injection Control Program authorized under the landmark federal law, the Safe Drinking Water Act. The UIC relationship to seismic activity and the development of the resource shale play. I will direct my comments to the regulatory approaches that govern the development of reliable and efficient energy as well as the economic engine, the jobs that are being realized from development of this resource. My comments will focus on how these events are impacting Ohio, the relationship between federal and state-based regulatory policy, and the process that validates the long-standing principle that the states are best suited to regulate the industry in order to protect the public interest and ensure protection of human health, safety, and the environment. Some background on here in Ohio. For over a century and a half, Ohio has been blessed with the production of plentiful oil and natural gas resources. At each uh, critical point in our history, it has been changes brought by technology that have produced, provided to the producers the ability to explore new horizons and expand resource base. Today, the ability to horizontally drill a deep underground reservoir with exacting precision, exponentially exposing the face of the reservoir rock to the well bore, has created massive efficiencies in our ability to produce oil and gas. Horizontal drilling has been a process that's been around for about 20 years and has been deployed now in many of the bases across the United States. Ohio is now beginning a new era of oil and gas exploration, <coughs> possible by technology that is unlocking reservoirs that until now were not accessible. For our entire history, we explored oil and gas from reservoirs where it had been trapped after migrating over the eons from source rocks where oil and gas had been formed and cooked in nature's kitchen. Now, we're, now we are drilling into the actual source rocks where most geologists believe 95% of the oil and gas still remains in place even after feeding the traps that have produced all the oil and gas that we have found to date. This is a radical departure in America's understanding of energy dependency and the availability of reliable, efficient energies. Even so, we have been drilling Devonian shale wells for well over 100 years in the state of Ohio. The resource shale play will reset the clock on available domestic oil and natural gas resources. The comments on the economic impact. Already, shale production has fundamentally changed domestic energy markets. Today, the industry is providing the American consumer an incredible energy bar for bar the bargain, providing natural gas price at 22% of its intrinsic energy value, a trend that the marketplace indicates will continue, continue into the future. It's also enticing the chemical industry, industry to re-enter the United States and build new chemical manufacturing facilities because they will have access to super competitive and plentiful feedstock jump-starting the job growth downstream of the wellhead. What does this mean for Ohio? Since 1860, Ohio has produced over 8.5 trillion cubic feet of natural gas and 1.14 billion barrels of crude oil. The state's geologists recently provided a volumetric calculation to estimate the recoverable reserve potential of the Utica shale, Ohio shale opportunity. He reported that should producers extract 5% of the oil gas in place, leaving 95% of the resource in the rock, Utica could generate 15.7 trillion cubic feet of natural gas and 5.5 billion barrels of crude oil. That is an astonishing number and perhaps a once in a lifetime opportunity for Ohio. The economic impact study commissioned by the Ohio Oil and Gas Energy Education Program determined that the Utica share will lead to the creation of over 200,000 Ohio based jobs over the next five years to support the leasing, development, production, and pipeline construction. Investments by oil and gas company will reach $34 billion to fund development, activity, and infrastructure. Producing wells are, are projected to generate $1.6 billion of royalty income to Ohio landowners and increase tax, re tax revenues of $478 million. Perhaps most significantly, the Utica Shale will make Ohio a net exporter of energy, providing locally produced low-cost energy supplies to Ohio industry for decades. 
coupled with the readily available and affordable energy resource, the expansion of job growth suggests that development of the Union Shield may be the most significant positive economic event to take place in Ohio for decades. The principal regulatory authority managing the environmental risks associated with oil and natural gas production are state agencies acting under state law or as a delegated regulator under federal law. To put the regulatory process in context, it is useful to understand some key elements of developing a well and generating production. Except on federally owned resources, the regulatory responsibility rests with the state oil and gas agencies for permitting well construction and completion. These agencies set the standard that must be met in drilling a well, such as uh, location limits, construction standards, including steel, steel casing and cement requirements, and surface management requirements. Well construction requirements are particularly significant because they are the principal methods of protecting against groundwater contamination. By creating a barrier between the groundwater and the well bore, oil and other chemicals from the well cannot move into water formations, and water cannot move into the well bore. This technological approach has been used effectively for 75 years and is continually improved. <coughs> well completion regulations determine the management of technologies to stimulate production of oil and natural gas and gas formations. Hydraulic fracturing is a well stimulation technology. Consequently, since its invention in the late 1940s, its use has been regulated by state oil and natural gas agencies. Throughout the past six decades, this regulatory structure has effectively protected against the environmental risk of fracturing without the involvement or intervention of the federal government. Proposals that the federal government needs to assert itself in well construction and completion regulations fail to show that any justification exists suggesting a failure of the current state regulatory process or that the federal government has either the expertise or the capacity to regulate 35,000 or more wells that are drilled annually in the United States. In fact, where the federal government does have regulatory authority related to oil and natural gas production, it relies on the state regulators to conduct a daily regula regulatory effort. Federal environmental laws apply to oil and natural gas production activities when waste is generated. Most specifically, with regards to the development of emerging shale gas and shale oil formations, the applicable federal law addresses the disposal of produced waters, including uh, flat frack flowback water under the Safe Drinking Water Act and the Clean Water Act. The applicability of the law depends on the disposition of the produced water. Produced water injected underground is regulated under the Safe Drinking Water Act. Produced water discharged to the surface is regulated under the Clean Water Act. The Safe Drinking Water Act and the Clean Water Act operate similarly. The federal government creates a national framework but the laws rely on state regulators to bear the larger permitting burden through the delegation of that rule from the Environmental Protection Agency. With respect to the Safe Drinking Water Act, regulation of underground injection is defined by the Underground Injection Control Program. The UI site program creates a series of classes for different types of injection wells. Class 2 applies to oil and natural gas production. In 1980, Congress modified the Safe Drinking Water Act to allow for primacy under the law to be granted to states for class two programs based on equivalent effectiveness rather than adoption of the specific EPA regulations. Most oil and natural gas producing states with active underground injection op operations have primacy based on equivalency with or more stringent than the federal program. Class two wells can either be used for disposition of water or for re-injection and formation as a type of secondary recovery to increase production. Only water produced from oil and gas wells can be injected in class two wells, nothing else. And it simply was, that would be a violation of the Safe Drinking Water Act and the Federal Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. According to EPA, the use of injection wells was documented as early as 300 AD, and large scale commercial use of injection wells in the United States began in the 1930s. The oil and gas industry isn't the only industry that has used injection wells as a safe and well-regulated disposal means. Other industrial sectors that rely on injection wells include chemicals, manufacturing, food and agriculture, plastics, metal, and steel. Ohio is home to 10 so-called class one wells that accept concentrated high toxicity waste generated by industrial processes. Ohio hosts 58 class three disposal wells that accept fluids used to dissolve and extract metals such as uranium, salt, copper, and salt. To 
today, there are over 100